Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Great. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and chat with you all a little bit this morning. I want this to be more of a discussion, so certainly if anybody has questions at any point, don't hesitate to stop me. Um, just a little bit of background. I practice primarily urogynecology. All of my patients are women, um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. I have um, an office here in Naperville. I see patients also in Aurora, and uh, I've practice primarily urogynecology. So I did an OBGYN residency and then urogyn fellowship. I just primarily practice pelvic floor related issues. I ought to have included uh, an epidemiology slide to talk about the prevalence of these issues. As you're all aware, pelvic floor disorders are very common. One in three women has some pelvic floor dysfunction and ultimately one in five women will have surgery at some point in their life for these dysfunction. So it's incredibly common. We don't talk a lot about it. As Vic suggested, one of my research interests is improved screening at a primary care level to diagnose women with these issues and then get them ultimately in the right hands for treatment. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about pelvic pain. It's a challenging topic to discuss and I think the easiest way to discuss it is through a series of patients. I'm giving you their, their presentations how we manage them and how they're doing at this point. Any questions come up, like I said, don't hesitate to talk. I hope at the end of my discussion you'll be able to at least have an idea of the different modalities available to treat pelvic pain, as you're all aware. Pain syndromes are challenging to manage because there are different things work for different people, so there's no set um, standard for how we're supposed to manage these patients. So I hope to give you and help you understand the different treatment modalities for pelvic pain management. As I discussed, the way I'm going to do it is a series of case discussions with each patient and from there lead into further discussion. So I'll start essentially by saying um, the important thing to remember in any patient experience, you're all aware of this, is in, in eliciting their history, it's helpful to get from the patient an idea of what their complaints are. And pain specifically, you want an idea of how, if there are any associations, any known triggers, what makes pain better or worse, how it relates to their uh, daily activities. You want to get a sense, uh, and I have, I'm sure you'll do a, a standard set of questions that I ask that pertain to what I do specifically. So I ask every patient about urinary incontinence, prolapse related symptoms, I talk about bowel function in everybody. It's far too common that bowel dysfunction correlates to all these symptoms, which we'll talk about. I talk about intercourse related issues, um, and um, other associated pains. And it's important that I don't spend a lot of time talking to patients about their past medical history and other things going on, but it's important to remember, especially with pain syndromes, there's a lot of correlated past medical history problems that go hand in hand with these issues. And it's important to know if, if a patient has undiagnosed or undermanaged general <coughs> medical concerns that may or may not be related to their pelvic pain. So a brief history of what their general health is like is helpful and what their social stressors are and those sorts of things. So we'll start here with this patient, MV. She was a 61-year-old female. She presented to me initially with urinary, lower urinary tract complaints, urgency, frequency predominantly, supercubic pressure. She didn't feel like she emptied her bladder well, and her, she was increasingly bothered by these symptoms, and she felt it was really interfering with her daily life. And importantly, in my history with patients, I always try to get a sense of what their priority is for treatment, what bothers them most. One, it helps me manage their expectations for treatment, but it also gives us an idea of how we want to prioritize their treatment options. As you'll see, and as you know from your patients, there are these patients tend to have a, a laundry list of issues. And if you ask them directed questions, do you have incontinence, do you have prolapse, one in three women has a pelvic floor dysfunction. The likelihood is they have those issues. But if they're not bothering them, if they're not interfering with their daily life, and I tell patients, if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. So I want an idea of priority of bother with these symptoms. And generally by the time they're to see me, on average, it takes a patient, once she's been given the information to make a referral to see a specialist, it takes them on average, the study showed nine months to get in. Not that it takes that long to get in to see me, but they wait nine months before they decide, okay, yeah, I'm committed to this, I really want to see you. So generally by the time they see me, they're invested in it, they're, they're really interested in being aggressive and managing it, but, but you want an idea always, I want an idea of their priorities. And it's also helpful to have those priorities because once you help them, and, and we'll get to this in some later patients, once you help them achieve one of their issues, it's probable that some of the other issues will then come to the forefront. And it's important to 
sort of um, evolve the priority list as you evolve with this patient. So on exam, this patient, suprapubic, and my exams are generally limited to the, uh, the pelvic floor, to the pelvis. They start out as basically, we, we do a set of vitals certainly, and I assess um, generally if they're having any shortness of breath and those issues, labor, breathing, any of that. I do an abdominal exam in most patients to look for um, any masses or tenderness, especially in patients who present with suprapubic crack symptoms. I always assess whether they're tender, specifically at the bladder, abdominally. And then the vulvar exam, for my patients includes uh, as a, a look at the vulvar skin and anatomy, and then a vaginal exam assessing skin and anatomy as well. I do a lot of prolapse, so I do a speculum exam, and then I'll always do a split speculum exam to assess support in both the anterior and posterior compartments. But then I also do a pelvic floor muscle assessment. So I assess their ability to appropriately uh, coordinate the function of their pelvic floor, to, to tighten their pelvic floor. I look for any tenderness or pain on the patient of those things. And then depending on the patient's age and complaints, a rectal exam, a rectal vaginal exam may be included in that. So in this patient, the, she was tender when I pressed suprapubically. She had diffuse vulvovaginal atrophy. She had a urethral caruncle. Atrophy is just the decrease in estrogen noted in the vulvar and vaginal tissues. Not uncommon after menopause, ovaries stop their production of estrogen and the manifestation of that in the vulva can be uh, skin that's thinning, uncomfortable, vaginally you can see, um, paleness in the tissues, irritability on exam, discomfort. Patients can complain of vaginal discomfort, pain with intercourse, vaginal dryness complaints. And it's interesting, you can correlate vaginal atrophy with exacerbation of lower urinary tract symptoms, I think, in these patients. I think if you have diffuse vaginal discomfort or vaginal dryness, you're, you, you just know that things in that area don't feel right. Patients tend to go to the bathroom more often than they should because they feel like something's not right, maybe I just need to go to the bathroom more. And then we know what happens when you tend to go to the bathroom more, then you make these issues worse. So she had diffuse vulval vaginal atrophy. And urethral chronicle is something um, that is not, also not uncommon in combination with vulval vaginal atrophy. It's the urethral's, the urethral's manifestation of low estrogen. The, the urethra is a clock face from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. It almost looks like a reddish polyp. I have pictures, I apologize for not having pictures. And it is just the way the urethra manifests, low estrogen. It looks like a polyp. You know it's not urethral prolapse because it's not circumferential. True urethral prolapse will be zero circumferential. This is just the lower portion of the urethra. It's the posterior portion. It tends to be red, irritated. Size will vary. They can bleed. They can be irritated. And I always uh, note it if it's there on exam. She has levator spasm on vaginal exam. So when I examine the patient, I'm, I'm talking to them, I'm doing all these things. I use a, a digital manipulation of her vaginal muscles. And Karen, the physical therapist who will come and give you an excellent discussion of the physical therapy modality, the, she will talk to you about identifying the muscles specifically. I don't do that. I sort of generically look at, is there increased tone in her pelvic floor muscles generally? And is she able to appropriately um, contract those muscles? Can she relax those muscles? It's important to pay attention to what else is happening when, when a patient thinks that they're engaging their muscles. Are they recruiting their buttocks or their abdominal muscles or other stronger muscles? Are they actually pushing down instead of pulling up, which isn't uncommon? And uh, are they able to control those muscles at all? And on this patient specifically, when I examined, she was, the muscles had an increased resting tone, so they were tight at baseline, which isn't always normal. And when I was palpating the muscles, she had tenderness on both sides. And when I asked her to tighten her muscles, she was unable to, she could isolate the muscles with some effort, but she was unable to properly um, relax those muscles, and her muscles were actually very weak. So those things are all important in my assessment. And when I examine patients, um, it's, it's a vulnerable exam. Nobody likes the pelvic exam. And so I, I examine these patients and then I tend to, as you can tell, I talk a lot and I talk fast. And so it's overwhelming for patients sometimes. And so I'll have them go to the bathroom and then get dressed. And then I talk to them about their plan when they're dressed. It just helps ease what is an already vulnerable and challenging situation. And in these patients who present to me with lower urinary tract symptoms and incontinence, I always look at their urine. I look for blood or bacteria. I don't need to tell you guys what their problems are with hematuria. We don't find a lot of 
problems um, from the, my screening related to hematuria, but we have found a couple of bladder cancers, and I think I'd be remiss in the assessment of lower urinary tract symptoms to not look at urine. So I have them urinate, and then I have them get dressed. This talks about the muscles. Karen will do a much better job of describing all of these things. The levator ani, as you may or may not know, is a um, three muscle uh, plate or bowl that helps support the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor muscles, I tell patients, are the foundation of the core, and you use them for everything. Your pelvic floor muscle's goal is to keep you comfortable. So increased resting tone in pelvic floor muscles indicates to me that your muscles are working overdrive for some reason. They're trying to keep you comfortable because you have lots of urgency frequency. They're trying to keep you dry because you leak all the time. And those muscles, when they're on overdrive, just like when you have all your grocery bags in both hands, you can't lift your hand up to turn the knob to get the door open because your muscles are already maxed out. The same is true with the pelvic floor. Um, and so these are the muscles specifically and where they are. I don't think that there's a, without a model, which is also challenging, I think it's hard to get a sense of what's where and how you assess things. I don't go through muscles specifically, Karen will. I just essentially look at the pelvic floor po posteriorly sort of um, at four o'clock and eight o'clock in my vaginal exam. I can determine if she's got increased tension or pain there. The pelvic floor muscle strength exam, I use a standard six point scale where I ask the patient, uh, I don't ever ask them to Kegel because I think that can be confusing. I ask them to tighten their muscles like they're trying to stop urine, which is confusing because you don't want them to actually Kegel while they're urinating. That confuses the, right, the bladder. The Kegel sends a neurologic message to the brain that says now is not a good time to empty, so doing it over the toilet is confusing to the muscles and to the body and your neurologic system, but the, that's the best way I can get patients to, to tighten their muscles. The other uh, sort of crass description that I've found, and I don't know of any better way, uh, I tell patients to imagine bringing a marble up their vagina. That helps to them to visualize what they should be doing with the proper muscle contraction. And while they're doing that contraction, I'm assessing what do I, how, what, what is my response on my finger from those muscles, and then I, uh, scale it and give it a score here, and this just shows what I'm using as my assessment of the score. And then the other thing I documented in my note is, okay, can they contract the pelvic floor, and then if they can, how long can they endure that contraction? And I don't want them there forever. My assessment is, can they hold it for three seconds or more, or not? So she's gone to the bathroom, she's now dressed, and now we talk about the plan. The challenging um, problem I see in these patients is I don't know what came first. So her complaints are urgency, frequency, suprapubic pressure. On exam, she has pelvic, diffuse vulvovaginal atrophy, pelvic floor muscle tension, and pelvic muscle weakness. I, I don't know what came first, chicken or the egg, and it's hard to, to ever know. I don't like to chase my tail. So I lay out everything for the patient, which can be overwhelming. I provide printed information of everything I say. Like you can tell, I talk fast and about a lot. And so I utilize some great resources, which I'll have pictures of and some web links at the end to where you can get patient resources. So there are terrific printed documents that talk about the bladder diet and drill. There's great information about vaginal estrogen, all those things. So I talk with the patient about everything I found, and I talk to her about all the possibilities for management, and then really I let the patient decide what she wants to manage first. Because really, if you look at this patient specifically, urgency, frequency, pressure, that the differential in that is vast. She could have a urine infection, which is one of the reasons I check her urine. She could have just generic overactive bladder. She could have a stone kicking around in her bladder. She could have bladder cancer. She could have lots of different things that could cause these symptoms. She could also have diffuse pelvic floor muscle dysfunction that's making underlying bladder symptoms worse. So we talked to her about all of it. The discussion with these patients always revolves around some idea of bladder diet and drill. And you know how that discussion goes. Nobody drinks too much coffee, everybody drinks enough water. But talking to them about known irritants, caffeine, alcohol, carbonation, making sure they're staying hydrated. I get crazy looks all day from patients who leak or have urgency when I tell them to drink more water. They think I'm crazy. But it helps, you know that. And then timing the trips to the bathroom, working to have the brain, the boss of that system, that helps. I'll give you, show you some printed information. Talk to her about vaginal estrogen. Vaginal estrogen is helpful to improve the integrity of the vaginal skin, improve the health of the, the, the vagina, which helps. There are estrogen receptors in the urethra and bladder. It'll help a little bit with her urgency.
urgency frequency, it'll help significantly with her vaginal comfort. Um, vaginal est uh, overall estrogen, I think, in my opinion, I think it gets a little bit of a bad rap. The way I dance around that is that vaginal estrogen, when used properly locally, doesn't tend to increase serum levels of estrogen. So I recommend, um, typically, half a gram two times a week in the vagina. Vaginal, local vaginal estrogen replacement comes in three different, um, you can do it three different ways. You can use a ring, it looks a little bit like a pessary, it's just a ring that's inserted, it's there for three months and then the patient takes it out, put it in again. There is a tablet, um, and that tablet is 10 micrograms of estrogen. They use that tablet two times a week. That's the lowest amount of vaginal estrogen they can use. Or there are creams, and there are several available on the market, and you can have them compounded as well. <coughs> Anecdotally, symptomatically, I think the cream works the best, and that's generally where I start. The cream can be a little bit messy. It comes with an applicator, which can be challenging to clean and to use, and so I tell patients to toss the applicator to just use their finger. I tell them if they want the first time they can use the applicator to measure out what a half a gram is, but to me, it, I just say a pea-sized amount on your finger, in the vagina, and around two times a week at bedtime. I tell patients that have a known urethral caruncle, especially if they're bothered by the caruncle, to insert the cream into their finger and then pull up a little bit so that the estrogen cream is, gets onto the urethra. The, and I tell them that the, you're not using enough vaginal estrogen, regardless of your, the way you use it, to increase serum levels if used properly. In patients with a history of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer who are on active estrogen, anti-estrogen treatments, those are not candidates for vaginal estrogen cream, but there have been good studies looking at the patients with a history of estrogen receptor positive breast cancers and the use of vaginal estrogen, and there has been no increase in their recurrences. So I generally think in those patients it's safe, but certainly one of the things I love, I hope it's evident, I love my job, but I also love the way medicines, the evolution of medicine and the focus on more multidisciplinary team approach. I couldn't do it with, certainly without all of you, I couldn't do it without the PT. I, I love the, the coordination and discussion with the oncologists and the primary care doctors and so on. Patients who are worried about it or have some concern I will, I will message, I'll, I'll reach out to their oncologist and get their opinions. I'll reach out to their primary care doctor and have a discussion with them that says this is benefits versus risks and in my, from my perspective, what are your benefits and risks and then we decide together. Certainly I don't force anybody to do it if patients aren't interested in it, that's fine. If patients want a non-hormone product for vaginal moisturizing, I recommend over-the-counter vaginal moisturizer products. There's several on the market, they can get them over-the-counter. And I, I describe it's just skin cream for the vagina, as you would use a skin cream for your hand or a skin cream for your face or eyes. So for this patient, we talked about bladder diet and drill, which certainly is a piece of her treatment. We talked about vaginal estrogen replacement. We talked a lot about pelvic floor physical therapy. We, we talked about bowel management. You all know, as well as I do, bowel and bladder are close anatomically. They share the same nerves. Any bowel dysfunction makes bladder symptoms worse. And I tell patients, frankly, I can't fix your bladder symptoms until you manage bowel symptoms. Nobody thinks they're constipated, everybody thinks their little rabbit turns every day is normal <laughs> bowel function, and we all know that that's not. So we talk about proper hydration. I generally focus on additional fiber in the diet and then over-the-counter supplementing fiber and Miralax if they need those things to keep things moving. And then in this patient, we talked about the management of specific levator spasm, pelvic floor tension, myalgia, pelvic pain from a muscle perspective. Now, I don't know if her urinary symptoms caused her pelvic floor muscle tension or if the pelvic floor muscle tension made her urinary symptoms worse. I certainly know that they're related. I talked to her about all these options and uh, work with the patient to decide, okay, where will our focus of treatment be? And I tend to be uh, simple, I think, in my management, pelvic tension, myalgia, pelvic pain stemming from pelvic muscle dysfunction, I manage three ways. Physical therapy, which we've already <coughs> talked about, Karen will talk to you about in great depth this afternoon, or later this morning, excuse me. Uh, and then I use vaginal volume. So the use of diazepam, 10 milligrams in the vagina at bedtime, will help relax the muscles in the pelvic floor. So diazepam, systemic muscle relaxer, when used vaginally can help with those muscles. 
the benefit of the diazepam in the vagina, big picture, is I like it as a, an adjunct. And I tell these patients, my goal is not necessarily ever to cure these issues. Statistically, even with prolapse issues, I don't cure anything. We don't understand these issues well enough to know what the true etiology is, and so I can't expect to, to fix it. What I hope to do is manage their symptoms so they can do what they want to do every day. That's the goal of all of these things. And so with the, the vaginal diazepam, it's a really nice tool for patients who say, listen, I, I can do my activities, but when I'm sitting for a long time, I notice the, the pain a lot worse, or if I've got to stand a long time for work. And in those patients, great, you have the diazepam on hand, you use it in the vagina on those nights as needed. And the, these patients who I start on the diazepam vaginally will evolve to that. I generally start at bedtime once a night for at least a week or two to see if it's going to work and then evolve some plan from there. It's a the generic pill, so it tends to be well covered by insurance. You probably will need to talk to the pharmacist who thinks I'm crazy writing an oral pill in the vagina. Um, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. And you um, expl have to explain to the patient that typically the generic tablet is a fluorescent blue or green. So it's going to give them a little fluorescent blue or green discharge. So you'll get a lot of calls about I have this strange frothy discharge that's just the pill disintegrating. And because it's used vaginally, again, similar to the estrogen, it works locally, so we don't see systemic effects from it. But I do warn patients that you may notice some somnolence the morning after you've used it. And in those patients, the options are 10 milligrams tend to be the standard dose, but you can do 5 or even 2.5 in patients who tend to get a little sleepy to see if that helps at bedtime. Or I have some patients who use it earlier in the night. So you put it in at dinner and set a bedtime, and then hopefully you'll sleep off some of that somnolence and you'll be better in the morning related to those symptoms. And then another tool that I utilize a lot in practice is vaginal trigger point injections. And it's essentially injecting tender spots within the vagina using an anesthetic-based solution. So I generally tend to use Marcaine, and it's for kind of twofold benefit. One, it's anesthetic-based, so they get temporary relief in the symptoms. And it's impressive to me how just a temporary relief in what the patient feels has taken over their life can help them get on with it. It helps with physical therapy and all the other things they're doing. And then it also, I hope, centrally breaks that cycle. So all pain syndromes are complex and I can't begin to understand all of them, but they, at some point your pain response becomes central. And when it becomes central, then less and less um, triggers cause more and more pain. So the idea with the trigger point is that you break that central cycle so that the patient doesn't become as tender with normal stimuli. That's the hope. So all my pelvic pain patients are offered pelvic floor physical therapy, some vaginal diazepam, and, and or vaginal trigger point injections. And trying one doesn't mean we won't try all of them. And I rarely try everything all at once. Because when you do that, even though the patient's miserable and that may sound ideal, you never know what works. And I tell these patients, and I try not to be um, um, sort of pessimistic, but I tell them these issues you may have lifelong, and my goal for you is to give you tools that you can use in your toolkit when these symptoms flare. And if we try everything and everything works, then you've got to use everything every time it comes up. So they, I explain to them that my hope is that we find what tools work for you, and it may be a combination of all these things, and go from there. The other thing I talk to her about is the, the urinary symptoms. So the urinary symptoms, as you know, could be just overactive bladder, urgency, frequency, um, leaking with or without, leak, um, with or without leaking en route to the bathroom. It could be an overactive bladder. You know better than I, overactive bladder we can manage with medications and <coughs> other ways. It could also be painful bladder syndrome. And this could be a whole nother hour discussion on its own, and it's a challenging diagnosis to make because there's no great way to make the diagnosis. It tends to be a constellation of symptoms and it comes with a lot of negative connotations. So you Google IC and it looks terrible. And all these patients have waited at least a few weeks to see me and they've all gone to Dr. Google. And so they, if they come to me, my doctor says I have IC, do you need to take my bladder out? It's, it seems sort of terrible. And so I rarely make the IC diagnosis. The way I handle it with these symptoms, with these patients is I, I gather their history, do my exam, they come back in and I say, and I use this, this is the American Neurological Association's um, ICPBS guidelines, and I give 
I print it out and I give it to each patient. But before I do, I say, listen, unpleasant sensation, pain, pressure, discomfort, related to the urinary bladder, associated with urgency, frequency, more than six weeks in duration in the absence of an infection. And most of the time, patients' eyes light up and they're like, yeah, that's what I have. It's like, sure, that's a constellation of symptoms. And then I explain, the, I don't know what came first, I don't know what causes this. I don't even necessarily care what you call it. What I know is these symptoms are interfering with your life. My goal is to help you manage these symptoms. And I use this guideline to one, provide hope to the patient to let them know this is how I manage all of my patients with these symptoms. And there are options, right? The sixth option is take your bladder out. It's not a great option. I don't do that. A urologist would do it. And it isn't my first choice, but it helps patients see that there are options to manage these things. And then we focus essentially on the first two treatment lines. So it's not displayed very well, you can't see it. The first one's stress management, pain management, patient education, behavioral modification. So all that stuff that we've already done. Bladder diet drill, I'm talking about constipation, talking about hydration. Second line treatments, physical therapy, it's the first one. Oral medications, including Elmerod down the line, intravesical bladder insulations, and then other pain management. And so I tend to focus right in these two, and I talk to the patient about what her goals are for treatment and how she wants to manage these symptoms. So with this patient specifically, it, they, they, they pick up the themes. And so I say, okay, you've got this issue that we can manage this way, urgency, frequency, pressure, give her all the options. I've, you've got pelvic floor tension, you can manage this way, give her all the options. And a lot of times they, they pick up on the highlights. And one of the highlights is physical therapy. Physical therapy comes up as a potential treatment for all of these issues. And physical therapy is something that I think is, it, I, I mean, it's clearly useful for lots of different things, but I think every woman at some point in her life should have pelvic floor physical therapy. I think it's that valuable. I think it's helpful for them to, to understand how to properly coordinate the function of their pelvic floor and then to use those skills lifelong. Um, so patients will recognize that you keep saying PT, you keep saying PT, you keep saying PT, and then depending on how the conversation goes, you know, I say that life is short, the most efficient way to manage these symptoms, you, you know, the way you can get the most accomplished would be potentially physical therapy, depending on what our issue is, which is the case for this patient, which we'll talk about. So this is bladder diet drill, you all know that, but I wanted to, to highlight some of the handouts that I give patients. So the International Urogynecologic Association and the American Urogynecologic Association both have internet available, not copyrighted, you can print and give away to your patients, great resources on a litany of topics. The, my two favorite are bladder training and then Augs does a nice job, that pink one, of highlighting pelvic floor muscle exercises in combination with bladder training. So, so I talk to patients just generically about diet and drill, and then I actually give them these handouts. Look, you should read these things and, and work on it. It's a great tool for patients. This, there, this is a fantastic schematic of what happens in a patient with low estrogen. And all patients who have low estrogen, I give them this. And it is a nice discussion of vaginal estrogen replacement. So the pictures there, again, I apologize, you can't see it great, but on the right, that picture shows what the tissues look like when they're low in estrogen. They're thin and pale, there's not a lot of blood flow, and adding estrogen helps thicken that top layer of tissue, helps increase blood flow. And then I explained, it improves general vaginal health, it improves vaginal comfort, and it helps, it, and I generally do explain to patients that it will help them improve any vaginal treatment option. So if a patient opts to use pessary, for prolapse, a little vaginal estrogen cream is going to help the integrity of the vaginal skin. It's going to help her tolerate her pessary better. It's going to help increase the longevity and long-term success of that pessary, in my experience. Um, certainly, if they're using pelvic floor physical therapy, this is something that the, the physical therapist will talk about. And the back to the multidisciplinary team, if I've seen a patient centered in physical therapy, but I haven't recommended vaginal estrogen, I'll get a note from the therapist that says, listen, she would really benefit from a little estrogen. Do you think it's appropriate? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but that's great to know that we're all working together for the same goal. And then pelvic floor physical therapy, I love that this is blank because Karen is gonna do a terrific job of explaining all of it. And you'll see later, it's an hour lecture in and of itself. I put it here as a placeholder to tell you that I discuss it, like I've talked about earlier to my patients, but I also, I preface it a little bit. 
So I make sure patients understand what it is. One, I describe to them how committed I am to it. I do think every woman should have it at some point to help learn the function of the pelvic floor. And I describe it to them briefly. I explain that they find a pelvic floor specialist. It's a, and I only know of women, and there may be men, but I say it's a female only, which is important to my patients. Um, physical therapist who's had special training in pelvic floor. I said she'll do an evaluation of you, look at your posture, your core, your pelvic floor muscle strength and coordination, and then she'll talk to you about what your symptoms are, what bothers you, help prioritize these things. Then together, based on her evaluation and your symptom bother, give you work, some work that you do privately in the gym with the patient, and I prepare them for the fact that it ought to, at least at some point, include some vaginal work so that they're prepared for that so that they don't um, freak out when they get to the physical therapist and she wants to do a vaginal exam and they think, wait, 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 my doctor already did that, what are you doing? So I prepare them for that. And then I also say that it, there is a component of a home program because as I see it, the benefit of physical therapy is the lifelong skills it gives you. So you're not gonna see a physical therapist every week forever, I don't think, but they're gonna give you tools that you should be working on at home. And it's really the emphasis of that home program that helps long-term system management, especially in these patients who've got chronic symptoms that'll wax and wane. It's important for you to, to dust off those papers and remember what Karen or the other physical therapist told you you ought to be working on long term to improve these symptoms. Bowel management, I got a card in my 20s that said never underestimate the power of a good bowel movement. And in my 20s, it didn't mean anything to me. But that sentiment could not ring more true every day at work and at home, right? I have small kids, but the, 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 dis the discussion with patients about how bowels are moving, I think is really important, especially because bowel dysfunction is very common, it's not well understood, and patients assume if they're, if they're having a small stool every day that they're not constipated. So talking to them about what the bowel should look like, how much fiber they should have in their diet, these are two brochures I think I hand out to every single patient. And I like them both in tandem because the Iuga brochure on the left, at the end of it, lists fiber in foods. And the recommended requirement is 35 grams a day for fiber for us and our patients. 35 grams a day is hard to get. An average apple is 4.4 grams. So think of how many apples you have to eat to get enough fiber in your diet. It's hard to do. And I encourage everybody to try to do it, but what's even harder is the day-to-day -day balance. So as we age, everything changes hormonally, and that the balance of fiber and water gets harder to achieve. And so if some days you're great, but some days you're not, and you're not doing anything supplemental, then you're gonna have up and down bowels. Up and down bowels, some days loose, some days constipated, are worse for bladder symptoms. So I encourage patients to supplement a little fiber, and I, big on a couple of things. I like Benefiber or the generic equivalent. It doesn't bulk your drink. It doesn't taste like anything. There's no added sugar. I'm really big on we get too much sugar in our diet. And so telling patients to take those sugary supplements, I don't know if it's great. I also don't know if telling them to take the sugar-free, sugar alternative ones are great. So I like just Benefiber because all it is is the fiber. And you can put it in the liquid portion of dinner every night. Put it in what you're already eating and drinking. And it just helps you achieve that balance. And the key with bowels is consistency. So you're staying on track. So maybe you don't get enough fiber one day in your diet, but you're already supplementing, so it doesn't matter so much. I talk with them, fiber needs water to work, so you've gotta stay hydrated. And the pink brochure, the AUGS brochure, has an actual stool chart and shows them what their stool should look like, which is really helpful because I'll show patients who say, well, I have a small stool every day, and it, it's the Bristol scale there, and well, you're, you're having a Bristol one stool every day, which is not a proper or appropriate to effectively clear your colon and, and manage your bowel. So these two brochures and a little bit of discussion, and then also just the discussion that I've already had, that there's a strong correlation between bowel and bladder function. And so helping patients understand that, realize that, and then work on improving bowel function is really helpful. And then as I talked about, my standard pelvic pain management. And I lay it out like these in every patient, and I let them decide together what their hope is and what they want to focus on. And as we'll see with some future patients here in my discussion, I have one patient who refuses needles. She is never a candidate for trigger point injection. She'd never do it. She doesn't want it. And that's fine. There are other options for her. But I lay these out and explain that sometimes they're used in combination, sometimes they're one-on-one, -on -one, but this is sort of the, the goal. One, it provides them a little bit of hope in that there's more than one option. And it also helps me know, okay, what have we tried? What hasn't worked? Let's move on to the next thing. Because as you know from your own patients, managing 
this constellation of symptoms, which seems like it's an ever, um, the yardstick's always changing. One day it's the frequency that really bothers them, the next day it's the incontinence. It's hard to, to keep a handle on that. So if we know what their priority is, we have that clearly listed, and then we work together through the treatments, it, it makes it um, simpler to work our way through it. The vaginal trigger point injections are generally, as I was saying, anesthetic based. It's a, interesting, if you look at the literature, the, I use marcaine in my injections. It's a little longer acting than lidocaine, but it's just the same. The, if you look at the data, dry needling, just using a needle to poke the muscles works as well as adding a little numbing medicine. Um, I'm not well trained in that, and I think that sounds a little bit cruel, and so I don't do it, but I know that it works well, and I'd be really interested to find uh, um, in an Eastern medicine doctor or somebody that does dry needling, especially in the vagina, to sort of work in combination with to explore those, but I haven't found anybody yet. I, there is one anesthesiologist that I know well who does a lot of Eastern medicine things, and I asked her about it, and she said, do you want me to poke needle where? Yes. <laughs> okay. So that was, she wasn't interested in that, but the, the way I do the trigger points is simply just injecting where there's tenderness, and most often that's within the muscles. Karen will do a better job explaining exactly what muscles and exactly where they are. I don't get to that level of detail. The goal is to just provide anesthesia so that they have some relief, but then also help break that cycle. The trigger point injections can also be used at the ischial spine. So in patients who have actual pudendal neuralgia, which uh, is sort of pinpoint buttock pain, pain down the back of the leg, worse with sitting, those kinds of things, those patients can truly benefit from specific local anesthetic directed right at the nerve. So then just vaginally, they make a pudendal nerve injection kit back from the OB days. I just find the ischial spine on vaginal exam and inject the anesthetic there, which has great uh, results. The benefit of trigger point injections is it can be done several different ways. They're generally done in my practice in series. So one works well, three generally builds on it and works better. So I plan them once a week for three weeks in series. They can be used alone or in combination with physical therapy. And sometimes patients need to see improvements in physical therapy. They need a little anesthetic to help get them there. They can't quite tolerate the full aggressive work that needs to be done with physical therapy because it's too uncomfortable. And so those patients will coordinate. They'll come to my office, I'll inject there at their trigger points, and then they go immediately to a physical therapy appointment. And the physical therapist then is able to um, be more aggressive and achieve new goals because the patient has pain relief on board. So we do those in combination. So those are the three that I focus on. And for this patient, and Karen's nice, she's, she'll also be talking about a similar patient, it was a combination of, I think, a little bit of all of this. She had some trigger point injections, which worked well. She used vaginal volume at some point, and certainly she was very active with physical therapy. She worked on bowel management, estrogen, certainly. And it's important, as I was in discussing earlier, to know past medical history. So this patient has a significant um, so psychiatric just sounds so derogatory, but she had underlying anxiety and depression issues. And those issues need to be well managed for us to be able to accomplish treatment of these issues. They're certainly correlated and they uh, are important to talk with a patient about just an open discussion that it says, I really want you to work with your appropriate physician, either your primary care or your psychiatrist to help manage these issues because certainly they're playing some role. And this patient was clear in her description back early on when I got the history that it is, of course, exacerbated by stress, which a lot of these things are. So we talked about management of those things. And um, again, the multidisciplinary team comes in really helpful. I'm happy to talk to the psychiatrist or their primary doctor about these issues. If I'm really concerned, which we have been in our office with a couple of patients and their affect and their mood and their underlying issues, I'll send a note to the primary that says, listen, I, I saw this patient for these issues. I'm worried about her underlying undermanaged anxiety or depression or those kinds of things. And I think that's appropriate. The, is someone keeping track of the time? Yes. Okay. 20 minutes. Okay. 20 minutes left or I talk? See? <laughs> no. <laughs> so the next patient, MT. And I think it's interesting, the pain patients, we tend to get to know them better than other patients because they tend, they're in the office more than the other patients. So prolapse patients, I see them, we decide how we're going to manage it, they have their surgery or they do their custody and I sort of see them once a year. Pain patients, they, we follow them 
I tend to follow them until I see some symptom resolution. So sometimes that's six weeks, every six weeks, sometimes it's every three months, so we know these patients well. So the, just the initials bring sort of smiles to my faces. The, this is a patient, 43-year-old female with chronic pelvic pain, he initially presented to me with complaints of bulge. And as I was suggesting before, the, it's common that the problem, their complaint evolves over time. So she initially presented with prolapse. She's got an interesting history. She's got significant prolapse, had two uh, prolapse procedures to address prolapse, one while she was pregnant and one between pregnancy. She's had uh, six vaginal deliveries and her initial complaint was prolapse. She's got underlying pain. I could talk another hour on prolapse. But the, the management of prolapse surgically was what she was interested in. It gets a little complicated with underlying pelvic pain in my approach. Because certainly she's demonstrated a recurrent trend to her prolapse. And those patients she may be best suited with a mesh augmented procedure. I don't have to talk about that now. But that's never my first choice in a patient with underlying pain because then the, the water's get muddy and you never know are her pain issues related to her underlying pelvic floor dysfunction or is it related to the newly placed mesh and so it gets challenging and so in this patient we initially started with a non-mesh surgery a vaginal tissue approach to prolapse which is my typical approach and she recurred and then in the discussions of all the treatment options then she underwent a mesh augmented prolapse surgery which is the sacral colpex she had a long history of pelvic floor weakness and dysfunction. She doesn't have much strength in her pelvic floor. She doesn't have uh, a, a well coordinated. She doesn't um, understand the proper Kegel well. She can't coordinate the function. And like lots of these patients, she's got significant psychosocial stresses, which interfere with her ability to fully commit to one treatment option or the other. So she's got six kids, I said, all of whom are boys, half of whom are autistic, she's got to care for a lot of these issues, and she can't commit to regular physical therapy because she's got to coordinate care for these kids. And so while physical therapy may be the most efficient way to manage all of her symptoms, it's just not feasible for her. And that's reasonable, reasonable, and that's helpful to understand with each of these patients what else is going on in their life. And she's somebody that I also have talked to about, listen, we got to get all these issues taken care of before I'm ever going to address these pelvic floor complaints. So on exam, her biggest complaint was that with prolonged standing, and she's a hard worker, she's got to work to support her family, she can't stand on her feet because she gets uh, dif diffuse pelvic pain. And I, I don't love the term pelvic pain, it just seems so generic and I never know what it means. Uh, but she would complain of pressure, heaviness, and fullness, pain shooting up the vagina with prolonged standing the pain of the vagina eventually radiated to her abdomen. So of course, she's had a mesh augmented procedure. My concern is initially starts out related postoperatively. So I do all the appropriate imaging, all the appropriate exams. She has no complication related to her mesh augmented procedure. She's not tender in her vaginal apex. She has no abnormal um, imaging findings to suggest that there's a problem related to obstruction or something with her mesh. And on exam, she's diffusely tender, which is helpful, but not helpful. Because diffuse tenderness, it's hard to know exactly where to start. And as I was indicating before, she's really weak on all her muscles. And she couldn't get to PT. We talked about PT. She had a physical therapist she had a great connection with. And she tried. She would run into two issues. One, she would, it would take her a long time to get the appointment scheduled. She would get to the appointment. And then she was too tender at the appointment to actually do anything actively with physical because she was so uncomfortable. She couldn't coordinate coming to my office for a trigger point. She wouldn't take needles anyway, so she couldn't coordinate that. I had vaginal diazepam on board as part of the treatment plan, which didn't help her enough to, to be active with the physical therapy, and so she couldn't. So again, back to the multidisciplinary team. Pay, I am really happy managing what I can manage in medicine. I, I like the idea that there's somebody else to manage high blood pressure in uh, hypertension, I mean, in diabetes, I'm happy that there's somebody to manage hematuria when it's related to bladder tumors or kidney stones. I'm, I'm happy that somebody can manage pain bigger than I can manage pain, and I've got a nice working relationship with lots of different pain medicine specialists. And so I've got a team that I generally will refer my patients when I've exhausted all of my options. I say, listen, your problem's bigger than me, you've got to go see this patient. And I, I don't think it's turfing, I don't think it's passing my problem off, I think it's admitting, listen, I can only do so much for you and I've exhausted what I can do, it's time to try somebody else. So I offered her to go see this group 
to manage her pain. The group primary treatment modality for these pain issues involves injection at certain levels in the spinal cord. She would not tolerate needles, won't even see the group because she knows that that's really what they want to do and she won't ever do that. So I have a discussion with this group. Listen, what are some of the other things I can try? She won't tolerate injections. This is what I've done. And the, they, he gave me some of their, their options that they use for these pain-related syndromes. And I'm not familiar, I mean, I'm of course familiar with all these medicines, I don't commonly prescribe them, but in my discussion with him, I was comfortable enough to give her these options, talk through the benefits versus risks, and then decide together which one we're gonna try and to then monitor closely how she does and, and what she needs. These slides are all available, you can have these things. Um, my understanding, it's not one or the other, it's sort of a combination of them. Again, back to my, I don't like to try too many things at once because then you never know what works. Nobody likes to take a lot of medicine, so I start with one and then move on. And she and I started with one medication that didn't make a lot of improvement. We happened on a second of the medications, which was the silver bullet. It helped her get back to her work, helped her get back to doing all the things that she wanted to do. Certainly, she's aware of her pelvic floor dysfunction that's not getting better untreated, but she's working as best she can with home physical therapy. And really, um, let's be honest, none of the things I do are life threatening it's not cancer. It's all quality of life. And my goal for the patient is clear when I see them from the first visit. I want you to do all the things you want to do every day in life. And if I can help get you there, that's, that's the goal. And so with her, these are the medications. Certainly, I think you should be working on pelvic floor therapy and all those things. I certainly want all of your um, health things to be in line. But if you can do everything you have to do to care for yourself and your family every day, that's the best I can ask for you. And so these, one of these medications was what worked for her, which is terrific. She's on the medication now, and she's really happy. She's able to have intercourse comfortably, she's able to stand for her job, she's able to care for herself and her family. So that's the best goal. So oral options can be a good adjunct to the treatment. Certainly if, if this isn't something you're comfortable prescribing or you're, you're not familiar with these medications, um, finding a provider who is, talking to somebody who is, is, is certainly realistic. The next patient, another, um, a different sort of look at pelvic pain. I've presented or will be presenting four different patients who have four different definitions of pelvic pain to demonstrate the, the vast variety in presenting complaints. But she's a young patient, 19 year old female. She comes to me with her mom. She's unable to achieve penetration with her Newly sexually active, and can't tolerate any penetration. From her gynecologist, her astute gynecologist, she's already had aggressive pel pelvic floor physical therapy. And in this patient, it's a specific combination of, there seems to be tension at the introitus, which interferes with penetration, and then beyond the introitus, she had significant pelvic floor muscle tension, which inhibited um, any prolonged, if she was able to withstand any penetration, speculum mostly, she was unable to tolerate it because it was uncomfortable for her. And her exam is just a little bit different. Like I was saying, in all these patients, I look at the vulva, I look for the skin. Some patients have diffuse skin conditions. There's a vulvar dystrophy, an eczema-type skin issue that can cause significant discomfort. So it's important to make sure she doesn't have that or a big lesion or something. Her skin and anatomy externally were normal. In patients who have penetration-related complaints, I'll break the vulva, the introitus, up into a clock face. And then using a cotton tip swab, I'll palpate along each hour of marking and indicate in my note which, where she's tender. And she had diffuse tenderness just right at five, it was diffuse from five to seven, but it wasn't anywhere else on the clock face. So she had a discrete area of diffuse tenderness right between the five and seven o'clock mark on a calendar. We talked to her about treatment options, again, the same as all the other patients. She had exhausted physical therapy. She was aggressive with PT and had made significant improvements, but she wasn't getting any further. She just still wasn't able to tolerate penetration. There are a number of topical treatments for pain-related issues, and one of them, you can use baclofen compounded into a cream. You can use lidocaine in a cream. Some of these patients just need estrogen if it's a vulvar dystrophy, a lichen sclerosis, skin-related issue, the management there is a steroid ointment. So she had tried different topical treatments that didn't help. She had tried certain oral medications that list I had earlier, none of those seemed to work. And then we talked to her about surgery. So all of my patients get to decide exactly what they want to do. And I, I like to think that I'm very honest with patients. I lay out all the options and I say to them, 
when benefits outweigh the risks for any of these treatment options, certainly you can go in that direction. Now, surgery on a 19-year-old on a vulva seems dramatic, right? The, the potential for risk there is great. You could cause future problems with dyspnea the rest of her life. You could cause narrowing of the enteritis. You could cause tremendous scar tissue. All of those issues, Bleed, not to mention bleeding infections for the standard surgical risks. But I had a discussion with the patient, her partner, and her mother about all of the options, all of the benefits and risks and then let her decide how aggressive she wanted to be and where she wanted to place her uh, agreement with, with risk. And she opted for surgery. She had done all other, she had failed conservative options and she felt as if surgery was her only next option. And so this picture shows the vulva and from our, is this a point? No. Okay. So from, so you can see, 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. So in this patient, on exam, she was not tender anywhere else, but from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, she was tender. Her tissue, it looked a little more erythematous in that area. I don't know if that's just my eyes playing tricks on me, but it seems, the tissue seems slightly abnormal, and that's where she was uncomfortable. In patients with this presentation, I injected lidocaine in the office in order to numb the area to allow her to fully tolerate a speculum exam, and she did. So to me, that's... An, uh, indication that surgery would be appropriate. That once I could take out the tenderness that she had right at those spots, that then she would be able to tolerate the, the penetration with intercourse. And she did that and she understood the benefits and risks and she underwent surgery. It's a 45 minute outpatient procedure. And it's challenging because <coughs> the post-operative care and recovery can be rough. As you can imagine, the perineum is a tough area to have sutures and be sore. There's no comfortable way to stand and sit. And um, I made her cry in the office several times. She was not very comfortable postoperatively, but she ultimately did really great. And she understood that there wasn't one thing that's going to work perfectly for all of her issues. And so she was able. She tolerated surgery well. She tolerated the recovery. I wasn't, she didn't like me for a while, but she got over that once she was comfortably able to have intercourse. But then it's a work from there to maintain these improvements. And so she maintained that relationship with a physical therapist. She actually used dilator work and was regular with penetration and or dilation to help the, the continue with the achievements that she had made. Um, and so she now can tolerate penetration, she's very happy. I no longer make her cry, which is um, important. <laughs> and she's doing quite well, which is great. And then our last patient, a 38-year-old female, I graduated from fellowship in 2014, and I think this patient was one of my first patients in the office, who presented initially sobbing in tears, devastated. And she, again, is a perfect example of how her symptoms evolved. So she started initially with urgency, frequency, bladder complaints. And then those evolved to pelvic pain-related complaints, which then evolved to tailbone-related pain. And that's not uncommon. Like I said, it's a, these are constellation of symptoms, and there's an evolution. And for her, I've used this analogy a hundred times. It's like peeling the layers of an onion. You just you get the deeper and deeper you get into what's going on, the more you find that bothers her. And when you address certain issues, then she's more aware of the other issues. So for her, it's been a combination. On exam, again, there was nothing abnormal. Anatomically, her skin was normal. She had diffuse levator spasm with tenderness um, bilaterally. And it's important, I think, to distinguish between just tension in the muscles and tension with tenderness. Because just tension in the muscles um, can be something that's just situational, right? Nobody likes the speculum exam. And so it's possible that she's just tight because the speculum exam. If she's tender with that speculum exam, it's um, more things. So she started managing her bladder symptoms, which were her initial priority, using the, the AUA guidelines. We started with, she had some installations. Of course, we made sure it wasn't an infection. She had physical therapy. The bladder installations helped her bladder symptoms. She, had a, she probably still sees her pelvic floor physical therapist once every week or two. So she's got a running appointment with her pelvic floor physical therapist, which is helpful. We started with vaginal trigger point injections. One of the things I didn't talk about is sometimes in addition to the anesthetic, you can add a little steroid to the trigger point injection to help potentiate the benefit. In training, I did that all the time. In practice, I've done it twice in both patients had systemic reactions to the steroid, or so they thought. And so both of them, 
um, reported feeling weepy and emotional, reported um, symptoms that they correlated with the steroid, and so I generally don't use it much anymore, but that's one of the things you can do with trigger point injections. But she underwent several series of trigger point injections, and they were all successful temporarily. The trouble we ran into with her is that once she was done with that round of treatment, everything would go back to where it was. And so, and she was using vaginal valium with some side effects. Her past medical history, history is certainly complicated. She has chronic fatigue issues. She's got significant number of allergies. Um, and we tried the oral medications that I listed and she had side effects to all of them. She's got some food allergies which preclude what you can use for tablet pills. Uh, and we sort of, you know, evolved to uh, Botox, onobotulinum toxin A, injected into the pelvic floor. So it's not the way the FDA has intended it for use, but if you look in the pain literature and beyond, it is well described, well tolerated, and I think an honest discussion with patients about benefits versus risks, including the fact that it's off-label for FDA, can, um, they can notice some improvements. And she had these injections. The way I typically will inject Botox in the pelvic floor, similar to a trigger point injection, find her tender areas, inject it. It works the same way that Botox works for the bladder, interfere with the bladder's ability to contract. It limits the contractility of those muscles. And she had sustained improvement from that injection, which is helpful. She, the, she is now able to do all the things she wants to do and as emphasized with the others is regular with her physical therapy these are things these are we're all a work in progress these patients included the resources i wanted to highlight there these are great patient resources they're great resources for you us just to scan and get an information on iuga and augs are those patient handouts i gave out as you all are more familiar with than i am aua net has nice guidelines so when my patients with oab i give them the aua OAB, non-neurogenic OAB in adult guidelines. I use the PBS IC guidelines from my patients and I just give them a copy so they can read through it. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Uh, clearly I could talk for several more hours. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't leave a lot of time for questions and for that I apologize, um, but I'm happy now to entertain any questions. Certainly. Have you tried um, lasering the vaginal wall? No. The, Sorry. <coughs> so, laser is um, evolving in the pelvic floor, and ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, has yet to sanction the use of laser in the vulva and vagina. And while I think it's probably a promising treatment modality, I don't think the data is there for me to accept the benefits versus risks yet. So, I think um, that may soon be something I'm adding to my treatment modalities, but right now it's not something. I'm waiting for the data. Behind, yeah. Yes. Question about the vaginal valium. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a tablet, not a compounded. So, thank you for that distinction. So, she's asking about the diazepam in the vagina. So, so, you can do it. You can, you can accomplish the goal of getting the diazepam two ways. So one is just the generic pill that they put in the vagina, or compounding pharmacies will compound a suppository of the diazepam, generally with other, um, like a, they make it, um, what do they put with it? Like vitamin E and other things to help tolerate it in the vagina. I found that the generic pill is the least expensive. Mm -hmm. And is that every night for two weeks? Or? So I'll start, use it in the vagina every night for two weeks, and then um, my nurses can tell you, we take a lot of calls, I have not called back, <clears throat> give me an update. Does it work, do you like it, is it helping with your symptoms, do you feel sleepy, and then based on their success or not, you know, or not with it, then we evolve from there. So I have some patients who are currently on it every night, I have some patients who are only on it as needed, I have a few patients on it every other night, the, the nice thing about pain management is I tell the patients all these issues, it's, there's no right or wrong. Everything's specific to you. So we'll together decide based on your symptom resolution what's the best course for you. Right, thanks. You're welcome. Karen. I have a question about sure. like, regenerative medicine, specifically stem cells sure. in your gynecological surgery and uh -huh. that is in progress. And right, so she's asking yes. about um, stem cells and regenerative medicine for prolapse. 
and pelvic floor issues. And really, that's the, I think, future. I think it's where we're going. The, the trouble with pelvic floor issues and prolapse is we don't know the true etiology. Because we don't understand the true etiology, we can't really effectively treat it long term because we don't know what's causing it. And so even after prolapse surgeries, we know pregnancy and delivery are related, but so is lifestyle, recreational activities, who they are genetically. And so I can never fix who they are genetically yet. And so I think the future of medicine will be, let's do your prolapse repair, let's also give you back what you're missing genetically that contributes to connective tissue support. So the I'm hoping that my kids' as kids figure it out and we're able to work on it. I think it's the future. But for right now, we, all, this is all we have.